This month's dividend growth stock is not a stock. It's an ETF, which means exchange traded fund. And it's not even a dividend growth ETF either. It's a different kind of fund entirely. But it may be worthy as a dividend growth investment because it yields more than 11%. Are you confused? Don't be. I'm going to explain everything. I'm Dave Van Knapp, and this is the Dividends and Income Channel. Before I get going, please help us out. Click the thumb up button if you like this content, subscribe to our channel, and ring the bell to get notifications about new videos when we put them up. Thank you. We need to start with a fast refresher on ETFs. Comparing stock investments to ETF investments, here are the main points to keep in mind. When you invest in a stock, you invest in a single company. When you invest in an ETF, you invest in a portfolio of companies. Both of them trade on the exchanges during the day, and therefore the prices change during the day. When you pick out a single stock, that's based on your own idea. When you buy an ETF, that ETF is constructed based on an underlying index that comprises its strategy. And the people that run the ETF follow the index's dictates as to how the ETF is going to work. So with a stock, you can be investing according to any strategy you want. When you pick out an ETF, you have to pick out uh, one that have, follows a strategy that's uh, close to what you want or exactly what you want. But there are thousands of ETFs available, so there are a multitude of strategies to pick from via ETFs. And finally, when you invest in a single stock, there are no costs involved other than your own time. No brokerage that I know of charges a commission anymore to invest in a stock. But with an ETF, the people that run the ETF charge what's called an expense ratio, which is a percentage of the total assets coming in that are in the ETF. And that's how they pay themselves for doing the work of running the ETF and following the index strategy. As I explained in my video dated May 4th, I believe that one can follow a reasonable dividend growth strategy via ETFs. And certainly a portion of any dividend growth portfolio can be comprised of dividend growth ETFs in addition to individual stocks. I do that myself. In this video, I want to tell you about an ETF that is not a dividend growth ETF, but it supplies lots of dividends without growing them. The question becomes then, could an ETF like that have a place in a dividend growth portfolio? There are three reasons that the dividends from a dividend growth portfolio grow over time. First, the companies themselves raise their dividends. Second, we reinvest the dividends to buy more shares that generate more dividends. And third, we sometimes make adjustments to our portfolio that result in more income. If we own a high yield stock or fund that does not grow its dividends, the first method is gone because the investment doesn't raise its dividends. And the third reason may or may not be available to us depending on conditions uh, in the market and in our portfolio. But the middle method, reinvesting dividends, certainly applies. In fact, the higher the yield of the stock or fund, the more dividends there are to reinvest. What if we had a fund that yields 10% or more, doesn't raise its dividend, but provides steady high income into our portfolio that we can reinvest? I've got an intriguing one for you. QYLD. That's what I'm going to call it, and that is its ticker symbol. And I'm going to say QYLD because it's easier to say than its formal name, which is the NASDAQ 100 Covered Call. ETF. This display shows QYLD in a nutshell. It was launched in late 2013 and started its operation really at the beginning of 2014, so it's a little over seven years old. It's attracted $4.5 billion in assets under management, which makes it the largest covered call ETF in existence, and I will explain what that means later on. This ETF operates with two underlying indexes, the first is called the NASDAQ 100 index, and I'll explain what that is a little later on. The second is, and the NASDAQ 100 index tells this fund what stocks to hold. The second index it follows is a buy right index, which it uses for its strategy. Buy right, again, refers to covered calls, and I'll explain those later. The yield, as I said before, is 10%, 11% or more. It has a dividend growth streak of nothing. It, has, it does not grow its dividends each year. It pays monthly, and every month the dividend uh, amount goes up and down a little bit, just depending on how its option uh, plays are working out that month or in the previous month. Overall, it tries to maintain a steady yield, but it doesn't grow the amount 
of dividends it's paying to you does not grow uh, steadily from month to month, certainly, and not from year to year either. It holds high quality stocks, and when, when we look at the top 10 holdings uh, in a little while, you'll see that. Most of QYLD's stocks don't even pay dividends. Rather, QYLD generates its income by selling call options against its stocks. By the way, QYLD came to my attention from comments on that earlier video that I mentioned about ETFs. So thanks for that. A couple people mentioned it, and I just want to say I listen to you guys, and that's where I got the idea it has led to this video. QYLD's stocks are in the NASDAQ 100 index, so let's talk about that next and see what kind of stocks we are talking about. Most of you guys know NASDAQ. It's a stock market launched in 1971 that offered the first all-electronic system for trading stocks. The NASDAQ 100 index is a selection of the largest, most active companies traded on NASDAQ, excluding financial companies, which has its own separate index. This slide shows the top 10 stocks in the index, and these top 10 account for 53% of the total assets in the index. The index is dominated by tech stocks. Um, the top 10 are all tech or tech-enabled companies, and I'm sure you recognize many of the names, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Tesla, Alphabet, Facebook, and so on. It's like a who's who of some of the most prominent tech stocks uh, in the country and in the world. This display shows some financial metrics compiled by Morningstar, and the reason I'm showing it to you is to show you the high quality of the stocks in the NASDAQ 100. Morningstar awards wide moats to 56% of the assets in the NASDAQ 100 and narrow moats to another 37%. That's a total of nearly 95% of the stocks have a moat rating from Morningstar, which is a, a widely followed uh, measure of quality for, for companies. And you can see the other grades that I've highlighted uh, on this display. They're all high, financial health, profitability, growth, these are all really good companies. QYLD follows a covered call strategy. That means that it generates income by trading call options against the stocks in the NASDAQ 100, according to a process laid out in the strategy index that it follows. Here's how it works. So what QYLD does is buys all the stocks in the NASDAQ 100 index and then sells call options against the index itself. So what the option conveys is the right, but not the obligation to buy the NASDAQ 100 at a certain price. QYLD sells those options to buyers that are willing to pay a price in order to have that right to buy the stocks, which they will do if the stock's price goes up beyond the, the uh, strike price that's in the option that they buy. So the call writer in this case is QYLD, and QYLD sells the option and receives a premium for each option they sell. The call buyer is another investor in the market, and they pay for the option, and then they have the right to call the stock if the stock's price reaches the strike price by the end of the term. QYLD sells one-month call options, so the term is one month, and the buyer will exercise the option if the strike price is hit. And I'm going to show a couple pictures of that in a moment to make the process a bit clearer. The option won't be exercised and the stocks won't be called if the month ends with the strike price above the actual price of the index. QYLD keeps the premiums no matter the outcome of the option. In other words, QYLD keeps the premiums whether or not the strike price is reached at the end of the month. Notice the price changes during the month don't matter. All that matters is the index's price at the end of the month. This display shows how QYLD itself illustrates how the call options work. There are three pictures. The first one shows a down market. In other words, the black price line varies throughout the month, but at the end of the month, it's below the red line or the orange line, which is the strike price for a particular option. So that's a down market, and in the case of a down market, QYLD keeps the shares. They don't owe the buyer the option anything. The middle picture shows a flat market where the price at the end of the month ends up exactly where it was at the beginning of the month, equal to the strike price. And again, the buyer won't call the shares. QYLD keeps them. The third picture shows what happens in an up market. So now the price ends up higher than the strike price, and then it becomes advantageous for the buyer of the option to call the shares from QYLD. The reason being that they get them at the strike price that was specified in the option, which is a better deal than buying them on the open market. Now, here's something to know. 
Covered call strategies inherently forfeit upside in exchange for current income. Because if the shares are called, QYLD does not participate in the rising prices of the shares. So the ideal scenario for QYLD is for the index's price to stay under the strike price for the duration of the option contract, which is a month, without going down very far. That way, QYLD keeps both the premium from selling the option from the options, the calls, and does not lose much to price decreases in the stocks themselves. And by the way, just so you know, QYLD's options are settled in cash. It doesn't actually have shares called away. You don't need to worry about those mechanics to understand uh, how QYLD works. QYLD's big attraction, obviously, is the income return. QYLD provided investors a gross distribution yield of about 12% over the last 12 months. A secondary attraction is that it pays its dividend monthly. Some investors really like monthly payouts. Personally, I don't care whether I get uh, dividends monthly or quarterly, but it's important to some people and it is a feature of QYLD. This chart shows QYLD's yield since 2015. And as you can see, uh, it has spent most of its time in the 9% to 12% range. Uh, QYLD in its own literature says that it targets 12% average yield. Right now, its current yield is around 11.5%. And notice that if you get an 11% yield, for example, an investor would make back in dividends or distributions alone their entire initial investment in nine years. That's one of the attractions of really high yielding investments is how relatively quickly they pay you back for everything you spent to buy it in the first place. This graph shows QYLD's monthly distributions since it began paying them in 2014. So we switched from percentage yield to actual payment amounts. Like all other ETFs that I have ever seen, QYLD's distributions vary from payment to payment. And since uh, QYLD pays monthly, which is 12 times a year. That's why this chart is so particular, particularly ragged uh, because those payments are varying from payment to payment. Just eyeballing an average on this chart, it looks like most distributions have been between 15 and 20 cents per share. This display shows uh, QYLD's purpose and how it presents itself to potential investors. It does not present itself as a buy and hold investment designed to amass wealth. So it doesn't emphasize total return. It does present itself as a source of reliable high yields that are paid monthly. QYLD goes all in on the covered call strategy. By that, I mean that it, it, since it's selling call options against the index that holds all the stocks, it's not um, picking and choosing what stocks um, to sell calls against or picking percentages of its total assets to sell calls against. It's essentially selling calls against everything that it holds every time it sells a call. That maximizes income. It also maximizes the risk of underperforming the index for the reasons that we saw before in that third diagram that showed what happens if the price of the index rises during the month that the call is operative. But even income investors don't like to lose capital while they are generating income. So now let's examine QYLD's total returns. I have three total return comparisons to show you that I think you'll find interesting. Here's the first comparison. It's QYLD compared to the plain vanilla S&P 500. You can see QYLD is in purple on all the slides I'm going to show you. Its total return since inception is 94% approximately, and S&P 500's total return over the same time period is 175%. These charts that I'm going to show you all include the reinvestment of the dividends back into the respective investments. So it shows QYLD's dividends reinvested back into QYLD, and the S&P 500's dividends reinvested back into the S&P 500. Now, that helps QYLD quite a bit because it pays so much in dividends. It doesn't help S&P 500 very much because S&P 500's yield is only about 1.3%. So S&P 500 doesn't generate all that much in dividends to reinvest compared to an investment like QYLD. Nevertheless, because of the price rises that have been happening over the last seven years, we're in a bull market that started in 2009 and with a couple of interruptions along the way, the most recent one being the COVID interruption in 2020. Um, the bull market has been continuous for longer than QYLD has existed. So the price returns on all the comparisons I'm going to show you do not favor QYLD. 
Uh, and in this case, we can see that uh, the S&P 500 has almost doubled the total return performance of QYLD. The next comparison is QYLD compared to the NASDAQ 100 index itself, which is what QYLD uses to write cover calls against. And we can see that QQQ, which is the name of an ETF that holds the NASDAQ 100 stocks, has almost quadrupled QYLD's total return performance in the, in, in the seven plus years that QYLD has existed. Again, there's a difference in income, however. QYLD yields 11.5% currently. The QQQ is only yielding 0.5%. Most of the stocks in, in the NASDAQ 100 don't even pay dividends. So there's that. But in terms of total return performance, QQQ is wiped out QYLD's total return. Finally, here's the comparison that I find most intriguing. This is a closed end fund that writes covered calls against the NASDAQ 100, just like QYLD does. The name of the, this fund is the Nuveen NASDAQ 100 Dynamic Overwrite Fund. Its ticker symbol is QQQX. And you can see that it has just about doubled the total return performance of QYLD in the time since QYLD has existed. I said that QQQX is a closed-end fund, and kind of like what QYLD does, closed-end funds are designed to convert total returns into income for investors. QQQX was introduced in 2007, it also buys all the stocks in the NASDAQ 100 index, but unlike QYLD, it only sells call options against a fraction of those stocks, which it keeps changing and engineering as the market, as the, the managers of the closed end fund watch the market. So they average out to about selling calls at any given time against about 55% or around half of the uh, stocks in the NASDAQ 100 index. And the result is that they get about twice the total return of QALD, but they pay about half the dividend. The current yield on QQQX right now is 6.2%. We've seen this display uh, before, the bottom half of it anyway. The bottom half is the monthly payout from QYLD. The upper half is the monthly payout from QQQX over the same time period. And you can see that the uh, payouts from QQQX, which by the way are quarterly, not monthly, are much smoother. The reason is that QQQX is a actively managed fund. It's not following an index paper that says what to do every month. It is a, a committee of people that work on the fund that make active decisions about what to do. And one of the things they do is they try and smooth out those dividend payments. So they've had a, a few changes over their lifetime, but many payments in a row run uh, are, are identical in amount, and that's why the line is, is flat across in so many places. Overall, if you're getting a trend, there's been a slight uptrend over the last seven years, but it's not very pronounced, and it could go backwards uh, at any time. Okay, we're getting near the end of the video. Let's wrap up what we just saw in terms of returns. On this display, I've put the total returns that we saw the yields that I uh, said out loud, and the expense ratio of each fund that we're talking about. QILD is the subject of the video, so I highlighted it at the top in green. Its total return is the worst of the bunch at 94%. Its yield is the best of the bunch at 11.5%. And its expense ratio is, I would say, high, uh, but not super high, at 0.6% per year. That means the QYLD extracts 0.6% of its uh, assets under management. That's a technical term, AUM, assets under management. They take 0.6% of that to pay their own expenses, pay their salaries, pay what it costs to run the fund. The first comparison was SPY, the ETF that represents the S&P 500. Its total return was about double that of QYLD at 175%. Its yield is very small at 1.3%, and it has the lowest um, expense ratio at 0.095%. QQQ, the NASDAQ 100 index, um, has the best total return because of the skyrocketing nature of so many of those stocks that, are, that we saw in the index. Its return since Q, QYLD has existed has been 352%, which is the best in this group. It yields just a half a percent, and its expense ratio is pretty reasonable at 0.2%.
And finally, the covered call index from uh, closed end fund, rather, from Nuveen that we talked about, QQQX. Its total return is in the middle, kind of equal to SPIs, actually, at 174%. Its yield is second best and about half of QYLDs at 6.2%. And its expense ratio is the highest here at 0.94%. Um, one word on the expense ratios, all the results we saw were after those ratios are extracted. So you don't take the, a performance graph and then subtract that amount from it. All the performance numbers are after the payment of the fees that each fund charges. This display kind of wraps up everything I've talked about in the video. Th these are my takeaways from the study of QYLD and the comparison investment funds that I compared it to. My first takeaway is that total returns tend to be inversely related to yield, and we saw that over and over. If it's got a high yield, it has a low total return by comparison, and vice versa. Low yielding uh, funds, and this is also true of most stocks, have higher total returns. Point number two, QYLD clearly forfeits a lot of total return in exchange for yield. We saw how much it um, fails to meet even its underlying index of stocks, the NASDAQ 100, because of the covered call strategy. Point number three, though, is that, however, QYLD's yield becomes quite significant because of the premiums being correct, being collected from the covered calls, around 11%, and they target 12% and have hit that target quite often during the fund's existence. Number four, QYLD pays monthly. Its payments vary month, but the yield uh, doesn't vary nearly as much. Number five, the potential role of a, an investment like QYLD in a dividend growth portfolio obviously would be to generate high income. That income, in turn, can be reinvested. Remember our, our, our uh, trinity of reasons that dividends grow over time in a dividend growth portfolio, and one of them was reinvesting dividends, which we control. So you could own a fund like QYLD or any of the other ones we looked at and reinvest the uh, dividends into more conventional dividend growth stocks. So you could go use that money to uh, improve your portfolio's quality, get stocks in the sweet spot of dividend growth investing, which is right these days around 3% a year in yield and say 7 8% a year in dividend growth, or you can shoot for um, lower yielding stocks that have even uh, larger growth rates, if that's how you want to use the money. And the last point is I do find QX, QQQX to be an intriguing alternative to, to QYLD. It does kind of what QYLD does, but it only does it about half as much. Therefore, it ret its total returns are twice as high, but its yield is about one half that of QYLD. You've seen it before, it shows the yield over time of QYLD, and I drew a yellow highlight line through this graph to show where I think approximately the average over long periods of time yield is, and it's in the uh, 10 and a quarter, 10 and a third percent range. So using that as a rough valuation metric, I would suggest that if you're interested in buying QYLD, that you do so when its uh, yield is, say, 10.5% or 11% or above. That'll undoubtedly mean that you're getting a QYLD at a good price rather than an, a, an overvalued price. Okay, thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you next time. Bye.